the novel we're about to discuss, uh, Let the Right One In, does contain subjects of pedophilia and extreme violence. So if um, any of these subjects that I just mentioned are triggering at all, please feel free to skip them. Um, as always, listener discretion is advised. Uh, thank you for your support and feedback, and I hope uh, you enjoyed the show. Welcome to Darkly Lit, where we learn more about the supernatural illness that infects the innocent and turns them into beasts. We are the Three Kings, or uh, I guess we were referred to ourselves as uh, Vampire Kings or something of like that, but it sounds like a band. <laughs> vampire <Are> Weekend. We? <laughs> yeah. We're the Kings of Leon. I am your drummer, Kayla King. <laughs> <laughs> our, our lead guitarist is David King. Roll 2d6 to see how many vampires you acquire. And then our bassist is the awesome Sade. Sup? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, here we are, part three of, uh, of Let the Right One In. Mm, yes, uh, yes. I, I wanna re- I, I'm not going to lie, this is probably my favorite part so far. Like, I just wanted to, like, yes, I wanted to keep reading with the other two parts, but this was the one I'm like, Oh, I really wanted to. Like, this pushed me over it's the It's getting edge. real. It's getting real. Um, so, <laughs> previously on... <laughs> <laughs> previously? <laughs> uh, I'll, I can provide the summary since you guys did it last two times. I appreciate okay. that. So, um, we begin with the, uh, I guess, the Chinese restaurant group. I guess what the... <laughs> I don't know what to call them. <laughs> That's uh, because of the... the, chi- the the CRG. The CRG. <laughs> They're still trying to figure out what happened to Jock. Um, and luckily, we do figure out what happens, because uh, not long after, Oscar is on a field trip with his class to go, I guess, ice skating. Mm-hmm. And his bullies come over and are like, yeah, we're going to mess with you still, because we're still bullies. And for the first time, Oscar does fight back and uh, actually hurts him really badly Mm -hmm. and then this leads to children finding frozen jock or well jock's frozen body under the ice and a lot of kids scream and horror unfolds Mm -hmm. uh oscar's mom is freaking out she gets a call i guess she gets i assume she gets a call from the school but she then calls oscar's dad which is interesting because we barely touched on him mm-hmm. in the past and this is the first time we actually hear him talk and then not only that he talks to oscar and says do you want to spend time together you want to hang out come over to my place we'll ride on a moped and he's like yeah um how about saturday morning and the reason why he wants to do saturday morning is because he's still uh, going out with elay and they're being cutie and stuff um so um he does meet with Elay, and uh, to show that they have a bond, uh, Oscar <laughs> slits his hand or his palm to say, let us do that weird thing that kids do where it's like, we must make a pact, let's have our blood mingle, that sort of weird thing. Mm-hmm. And Elay sh- starts to show her true self, like, because when he first meets her, she's not looking good, and her hair is turned white, or more than normal, and she starts to get a little beastly like uh his blood comes from his hand and she licks it up and he starts to be afraid of her and runs away um uh the crg meet at gosta's place and they're drinking getting drunk and all that and when virginia leaves uh uh she is attacked by elay later that night and um Elay sucks her dry, or doesn't su- no, she doesn't suck her dry. Elay uh, gets enough blood to heal up, but doesn't kill Virginia. And this eventually leads to Virginia to start to show signs of vampirism, or vampirism. <laughs> um, 
Uh, when Oscar- Porphyritic hemophilia, the- if you go with the uh, the old Elder Scrolls definition. That too. Um, Oscar visits his dad, and actually they seem to get along very well. They're having fun times. But then his friend, I, John A? Jane? Jan? Ja- John? John? Goes for a visit, and immediately Oscar's like, no, go away. And this is when Oscar's dad gets drunk to the point where Oscar's like, I'm not staying anymore. And you realize this is a point of contention with him and his dad. So Oscar leaves... Uh, and heads back home. Um, uh, if I recall, is it the same? Is it that same night? Yeah, it's the yes, same night. Same night. Uh, while Oscar's heading back home, Eli actually goes to visit Hakan, who's been in the hospital, basically can't talk, and the cops are still visiting him. Like you're gonna, you're gonna tell us who you are. We're gonna figure out who you are eventually. Um, Eli actually goes to see him in his window, and. Uh, Hakan convinces Ile to bite him, and uh, the police actually do see her and see her jump, and they're like, how is this kid, barefoot, able to jump? What happened? How How is this possible? And they think Hakan is dead. Uh, and later on, we realize that's not the case. Hakan's now turned into a vampire, and there is a gruesome scene between <laughs> him and the morgue attendant. Um... Uh, Oscar goes to see Ile and actually um, uh, ask her up front, hey, are you a vampire? And, I mean, she doesn't say she is a vampire, but she has an illness. And they interact, and he gets to know more about her, um, including the fact that her real name isn't Ile, it's Elias. Mm. So, I think that's a good summary for now, I would say. I think that was pretty good, Kayla. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um uh, Where do where do we start with this part? Oh my goodness, there's a lot. <laughs> um Uh I guess I mean we- I guess we could we could break it up approaching the different groups and what happens to them we- saving Oscar and Eli for last again. That yeah. seems good. But so I, I feel like they start to interconnect quite a bit though. Th- they the- do. Yeah, they're all coming together. I guess we should start with the the Chinese restaurant group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because now they've started to become more important to the story cuz Jock's Jock's death has very much been the the catalyst for getting them involved and now uh now Virginia is in this deep, you know, the the whole reason uh Eli didn't get to finish off uh, Virginia is because Jock showed up. Or no, Lock. Uh, Lock, Lock, showed, Lock, Lock showed up. Lock showed up. Lock it. Lock. Uh, Locke? Locke? Swedish name. Locker. Swedish name. Locke. I Locke. I don't know. Locke, Locke. Locke. shows up. Yeah. Uh, shows up to save her. Well, because he was. So they were. They went to. Uh, whose apartment? Goose, Gustav? Go- Gosta? G- Gosta. Gusta. Gusta. Yeah. Because remember, they're all drinking, and Virginia's like, can I open the window? And he's like, no, I have cats. cats the cats will get out, but it smells <laughs> well, like this. I kind of related like there, because I hate like when my family leaves the door open too long. My cat's too scared to run out, but she gets curious, and then I get paranoid. <laughs> I'm like, close the goddamn door. Um, <laughs> yeah, so they're all in Gustav's apartment uh, drinking, and I guess they were they went there after the discovery of Jock's body, hoping that with that information, Gustav would go to the police finally, but they they can't seem to convince him. Lock, Locke, Locke, Locke. Lack. Sorry. <laughs> is super upset. He says some things of like how Jock was like his only friend, and they were like this, and he holds up his fist. And uh, <laughs> poor Virginia, who is who does love him, and Lockett does love her, like, he kind of just like, no, you're a whore, and says terrible things while drunk, and so Virginia leaves, and because she leaves is why she happened to be there, that Eli was able to attack her. Yeah. I gotta admit, they did build up uh, Virginia and Lockett's relationship, yeah. very well before this so mm-hmm. it is remember in part one we didn't care at all about the chinese restaurant group, no and, and now <laughs> but, but it's interesting now yeah like they're now involved in a mu- in a much deeper way especially virginia oh gosh well yeah the, the very the parts that were really interesting to me were we're seeing how we're getting a first person perspective of someone who is 
turning into a vampire. Mm -hmm. That part where she is at work and, like, I don't know, counting shrimp, was it? Yeah, Mm -hmm. she was counting shrimp. So, for our listeners who don't know, I, I work as a sushi chef at a restaurant. And there are times when I have to prep fish where I have to, like, peel the skin off the shrimp. And, like, there's the end a part of the tail that is actually, like, you can poke yourself on it. Um, and so, I don't know, I just, like, very was, like, oh, fucking shrimp. Just kind of, like, feeling her just, like, exhausted fucking dealing with these cold shrimp. And I was just like, I get you, girl. Just go home. <laughs> <laughs> and even, um, even they were like just go home you, yeah. you just got back from being bitten like just from the hospital and and by the way uh, according uh uh lake got a good look at um ele and ele yes. is full-blown feral vampire form with claws and and fangs and everything mm-hmm. when he sees her by the so. way uh the interesting part is we are shown that, or, like, we are given uh, much more detail of that from her point of view. How do we feel about that? Because I... What, that she shaped, that she transformed? No, 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 but, yeah, like... Yeah, well... Or from Virginia's. No, but... Well, no, from Eli, because there's the part where she's like, okay, I'm in the tree, and okay, my, like, teeth are changing, and, like... Um... I don't know, like, it... When you get that close to the monster, it kind of removes, like, how scary they are. Like, okay, the, what we're actually, like, witnessing through Eli mm-hmm. is kind of terrifying. Like, oh, shit, this is a, what looks like a child, but look at those teeth. But, yeah. like, at the same time, it also kind of, like, familiarizes us with her, and it becomes more tragic than it becomes scary. I yeah. Think. And I think that was intentional, especially later with, like... Well, it was it already happened at that point where Oscar ran away, but we're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. She she's becoming more of a tragic character than if she was already a else. fairly tragic character, yes. but like again, I think we're we're meant to both be, you know, we're not meant we're meant to only empathize with her so far or sympathize mm-hmm. with her so far, well, you know. Well, if you remember I'm, when we first see her attack, it's actually all from Jock's point of view. That's and right. Then, mm-hmm. This is the second time she's actually attacked and a good chunk of it is from her point of view and her preparing herself, knowing she has to do this. Uh huh. And it, we, as we mentioned before in the, um, the previous episode, when you put it a distance, you see her as a monster. So when right. we saw her from Jock's point of view, it's oh, she is a monster. She is manipulative. But then later on, as we get to see from her point of view, then we realize, oh no, she's. I mean, she is a monster, but. She's a tragic monster. Yeah. You feel for her. Yeah. And I, we're mainly, we're t- I know we're touching on Ile right now, but, and there's, there'll be, I think there'll be more context for that, especially when we talk about her and Oscar mm-hmm. and their relationship as that develops. So, yeah, I do want to focus on Virginia for a bit, but yeah. really quick, I do want to say every time that we've seen Ile attack someone, we've never gotten the impression that she actually enjoys it or wants to. No. No. It's always been, okay. I am, like, turning into, like, a little tiny old child and wasting away. I need to feed myself. Mm -hmm. So. It's kind of interesting because now that we're getting Virginia's perspective, we're getting that that whole sense. And this is a a classic trope that the the hunger... A va- vampire vampires do not do this for pleasure. They do it because they have to. At least the ones mm-hmm. in this universe. Mm-hmm. And Virginia hasn't quite gotten there yet, but she started sucking, you know, blood from her own hand, and it gives her, it as she calls it, the 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 the, the wriggling. What was it? The the fish, the wriggling fish, like the the anxiety sensation all through her, the antsiness mm-hmm. makes her calm down, brings her some sense of comfort. Mm-hmm. But it, that while well, she's got this this quote unquote illness uh, that she hasn't figured out how to explain yet. Well, everything that she eats tastes bad, and the first time she actually puts something in her mouth that isn't blood, which was the sleeping pills, if I recall, mm-hmm. she throws it up immediately. Right. She mentions that the wine tasted like dishwater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like- that reminds me a lot of, uh, there's a series that I started enjoying, and then I guess every, the end, the end wasn't so well. Uh, there's this anime called, what was it called? Fucking... <laughs> oh, I can't fucking, remember what I, I enjoy it fucking. was called. One with the ghouls. 
Tokyo Ghoul? Or, Tokyo Ghoul, thank you. Yeah, the the main character, the, the first iteration of that series, he uh, ends up getting an organ transplant from a ghoul by mistake. Oh. And it turns him into one. And he's, like, trying to eat, but everything just tastes awful to him. And he and it makes him sick if he swallows it. So that kind of reminded me of that. And I do, I, I like that aspect of, like, this is how it works for a vampire. They can't eat anything else, even if they wanted to try. Mm-hmm. Um, well, have so, we yeah, learned, poor Virginia. Have we I'm, learned if animal blood can sustain them, or is it only human blood? Do we know um, at this point? We haven't. Because no. sometimes in some lore, animal blood is enough to sustain vampires. It just doesn't have the same... You have to d- drain a lot more animals than you would, like, say, humans. Yeah. Like, human blood is the main thing that a vampire needs, but they could subsist on animal blood. Uh, just in, they have to do huge quantities of it. So. Mm. Hmm. We, ha- we haven't seen that, but who knows? Maybe we will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thinking about that, yeah, people are... I think if that were the case, though, like, say I'm a vampire here in, like, the Portland metro area, I think people would notice less if one homeless person, we got a lot of homeless people, went missing, oh. mm-hmm. versus if I had taken out an entire neighborhood worth of cats. That's true. Yeah. People are going to notice that more. You know, you could re- easily do a story about that and have it be a, a total, like, you know, class inequality commentary, you know? Well, there Ooh. is... A socioeconomic commentary. Uh, you know the game Vampire in the Masquerade? Yeah. Uh, I Now, I've never played the RPG, but I did play the video game. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the game... You a lot of the people that you can suck as a vampire are um, prostitutes and uh, homeless people. Mm-hmm. But um, and, and that's one of the ways that you can subsist uh, or live. Uh, but it depends on what kind of vampire you are. If you're a blue blood type vampire, apparently <laughs> sucking a prostitute or homeless person's blood will make you sick. Oh, wow. Because of the type of vampire you are. Because you have to only drink the fine quality, which, that that's uh, <laughs> that's so bad. It's really bad. But the, the funny bad. part is, the villain of the story is, or one of the villains in the game, is a blue blood vampire mm-hmm. who thinks way too highly of himself. So That sounds about right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was going to say, it's almost a similar case to Los Angeles, you know? Yeah. It could happen here, too. Um, but actually, uh, on the topic of vampires in general, this is the first time this part had the first time anywhere in, in this book where the word vampire specifically has been used. Mm-hmm. Oscar is the first one. Oscar is the first one to say it. He figured Ela was a vampire. I'm like, there it is. There it is. You know? And, you know, she may not deny, she may deny it, but I mean, all the symptoms mm-hmm. are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Even even uh, Locker Locker is like that kid was a vampire. I don't want to say it. I said it once, and I kind of wish I hadn't. But that's kind of what it is. Mm. Lock? Did you just say Locker? I think I did. I um, <laughs> let's call uh, him Locker to like recap fr- to recap before we do the episodes. I've been listening to the audiobook as well, and like so, if I say the name weird, it's because that's what the audiobook. Oh, I'll trust really? your judgment on that then, on any sort of name pronunciations. I'm good with that. Yeah, if it's pronounced kind of like locker or locker, uh, I'm fine. I'm good with it. I- <laughs> okay, so if that's is is Jock pronounced Jock? I think so. Okay, because they have very similar spellings. Mm-hmm. Ex- you know, just with the J and the O instead of the L and the A. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> So Virginia, yeah. So so this is interesting because like so now I don't know what's going to happen with Virginia, but this is very deliberate because now we have another burgeoning vampire, if not a proper vampire at this mm-hmm. point. You know, like she didn't she didn't die, so vampires are not undead per se. You know, no. Uh, as Ile mentions, she's not dead. She's it. She's just someone who's suffering an illness, and yeah. that's. Really, how it's portrayed as it's an illness. Yeah, it feels very biohazardy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is there more to be said about this the, this collective, particularly Virginia? Because uh, 
I did. I did really like this part. I liked seeing yeah. it from Virginia's perspective. I think it really gave us some insight into what it's like to con- con- contact vampirism, basically, and that was really cool. Mm-hmm. I I want the parts that I kind of really enjoyed was like um, what was a uh, lock locker and uh, locker <laughs> and his kind of like his guilt for the for the way virginia is like he's like well she she wouldn't have been attacked if i hadn't made her run out mm-hmm. and then he like just showing up with like a box of chocolates but like virginia is like so far gone and just uh those little details where he's like whoa something's wrong because normally she just opens the door she doesn't you know ask who's there first mm-hmm. you hear her steps the door opens and you're in and you know, something's wrong. Well, I mean, that would I, I would figure that'd be a normal reaction too if you had been assaulted by a tiny by some True. by a child. Yeah, yeah, even yeah. A, well, by assaulted anyone. by anyone, yeah, you would. Definitely even if it was a more. child, you'd start locking your door. You'd be more paranoid. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah I get I get uh, Locke's um, like confusion, but a little bit. I'm like common sense would say though that she just what she literally just got through. A traumatic experience mm-hmm. so like i don't bl- and they and yet she still wants to get up and go to work right away i think um actually this is fairly realistic of someone who's been through a traumatic experience sometimes i mean not always but um after going through trauma the first thing she wants to do is do something normal uh-huh. something that's familiar to her whether it is just going to work and getting it her going through her normal day to day routine. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, tomato uh, soup, five kroner. I mean, <laughs> there. I mean, there's been times. Uh, okay, this is this is a sad and downer, and I apologize for this. But when my dad died, um, one of the first things I did was go back to work, and they're like, "Why are you here?" And it's like, I just need to feel normal right yeah. now. So, yeah, that that is very believable. No, I get it as a coping mechanism too. So, yeah. I don't know what much more to say about Virginia. I I, I like very curious where where she's going to end up. Mm-hmm. I, I do like that it was added because Ely has been through this for many years, so she's a seasoned vampire. Where Virginia is a burgeoning one, and it's yeah. interesting to see from someone's point of view who's. Is it just me or is Ely's work really sloppy in this chapter? I was just about to say, like, for as much as she was like you gotta finish him off she's like we okay are are we gonna see her go back after virginia i don't Um, know like did she uh when you know previously she'd been fairly thorough especially with jock but like here well she she was also kind of pushed by desperation too because the whole reason she got frenzied was because of uh, seeing oscar's mm -hmm. blood so Mm -hmm. uh (laughs) If I recall, no, she she actually twisted his head, right? Yeah, so that he yes. wouldn't come back, so okay. he wouldn't reanimate. Yeah. But he left. She left him, and then Hawkins like, really? And then had to go. Had go. to deal with the body himself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So she is still kind of messy. I feel okay. One of when the, the hunger takes her. Well, one of the things that she does say, she's uh, he says, "So how old are you? Are you?" She's like, "I'm 12. and he's like, "But you've been here a long time." And she's like, "No, but I don't." I just don't age. I still remain 12. She technically, I think what she means is her mentally. Yeah. She, she does give that implication. Yeah. She's a fixed point. Yeah. She, yeah. she does not age, not just physically, but mentally as well. Mm-hmm. So it could be that she does have enough sense to know that I should probably kill this person after I feed. But if something goes wrong or if she has killed someone, she just doesn't know how to take responsibility enough to get rid of the body or go back and finish the task. Is that why she needs it? I mean, among many reasons, it's probably why she she recruited uh, Haken as yeah. a helper. Um, actually, uh, I'd like to delve into Haken a little bit. I didn't. Yeah, because the second time mm-hmm. she fucks up and. <laughs> Ooh-wee, that was my favorite uh, part. The end almost of that. gets caught again too. Yeah. No, this part was this part was great. Well, I didn't touch upon this, but uh, we actually get to see or not see, but Hawken actually delves into how his life went downhill, and then he feels he was saved by Ely because yes, 
It wasn't because of Eli that he lost his job and everything. I figured that was the case. No, it was, once again, it was his own fault, mm-hmm. basically. Someone mm-hmm. someone outed him as a pedophile, and therefore he lost everything, which, to be fair, kind of deserves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, you know... Should we... So he got outed as a pedophile because he did something to a kid, or no? He, he just... they, people people found out he was apparently getting um, he was getting material in the mail, okay. videos, okay. Because yeah, because photos. One of, I remember one of the things he said is, he, of course, he never did anything to any of his students at school. He, like he he was saying, I'm not stupid, but. Uh, but, you know, well, the other thing, too, is, like, the whole time, you know, he's, he, narratively, he's presented as this very rational, intelligent person, which is, you know, kind of true as someone who was a foreign professor. But, again, he's a monster, because he's a, he's a friggin', I mean, he's he's complex, but he's still a monster. He's still a pedophile. Mm-hmm. He still preys on children. I mean, one of the things he does when he first meets Ile is he puts her hand, or his hand, on her thigh. Yeah. That's... Like, first thought, doesn't do, even think about it. He, he's drunk, and he's trying to kill himself by basically drinking himself to death. In That's that right, I right? forgot about that, Because yeah. someone, someone threw, what was it, a Molotov or a firebomb or something? Someone threw something into his apartment and burned it mm-hmm. down, mm-hmm. and he lost everything. So. Oh, yeah, his life is downhill, and then Eli's naked. And then Eli shows up. I think it's mu- it's much, it's interesting that, I think I was really expecting that Eli was just going to, you know, end him, and it was going to be the ending that he actually wanted, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, he's drinking yeah. his... And he tried. He did try to kill himself. He managed to jump out that window in the oh, hospital. Oh, yeah, that's right. Did he jump or did he Did he fall? I mean, it, does, it doesn't matter either way, because either way, he wanted Ile to, to just kill him. If yeah. that was going to be the last way that he could serve Ile, then that's what he wanted. Yeah, the the impression I got was that he jumped, like he he clambered out the window, and the nurse tried to stop him, but he fell ten stories and splatted against the pavement. But apparently, that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough to to make him not become a vampire in the end. That scene with him in the morgue attendant. <laughs> Or he's like, hey, this thing's still oozing. And it's he good. goes back. Like, he could have gotten away, but he got out of his car and went back. Oh, that guy was so he dumb. Went, he, he was, was oozing in- plasma. They said specifically it was plasma. It's like yes. blood uh-huh. without blood cells. And I, he's in the car, and it's like, oh, I messed up. And he goes back and like, no, no. The, the part that was so squint, that was so squicky about, or disgusting about it for me, was when he shoves his finger in uh, the morgue attendant's ear. And he says he got far enough where he hit something in his brain and it just went off. Yeah. It's like instant death, I presume. That or instant unconsciousness yeah. so he could drink his blood. <laughs> the whole, no, <laughs> a lot of the scenes with Lachlan are the most horrifying, I would they, say. They're either just distasteful and that you feel gross reading them or they're just like, like viscerally awful and honestly his chapters have been my favorite because <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're so disturbing yes yeah well it's kind of like when i mentioned like oh my gosh they describe how horrible his face is so beautifully yeah. i love uh-huh. it and it's true mm-hmm. and that scene with him in the morganton i'm not gonna lie is one of those he's like oh my gosh this is frightening and I'm actually, here's the thing, knowing what's happening here and knowing that this was at the end of a part, I means that Hawken is out there as a vampire, and now he's probably going to go after, he's going to go try and find Elay, which is then, of course, going to throw him in Oscar's path, too. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So. Oh, no, the whole thing is so uncomfortable when you realize what's going on and what's happening, and it's all from the morgue attendant's point of view. I can't remember the character's name. He had a name. He did have a name. I can't remember uh, let's see if i can find it he's he's his name is a corpse so <laughs> <laughs> a corpse he might as well his name might as well be mud to use an old saying is it benko he, ben? benko yeah that's the one benko? something benko. like that i don't that's, remember that's, how that's it was him. pronounced yeah uh he almost made it to the elevator and he made all the dumb horror movie he did all the dumb horror movie things that you're not supposed to do uh that idiot but yeah it's benke or benke, benke. Or bank. Banke? Bank? It's spelled B E N K E. I just call him Ben. Ben. Yeah. So <laughs> this is Ben, ben. Jamin. No. Anyway. Um. <laughs> but yeah, the whole scene is basically something out of a horror movie. 
A finger pushed into his ear and he heard the bones in the ear canal crackle and give way as the finger forced itself in, further in. He kicked out his legs and when his shin hit the metal bars under the gurney, he finally screamed. Oh my gosh, it's so horrifying. And then let's not forget, this whole time, Hawken has a boner. Like, remember that? Oh yeah, that's right. Just straight up boner. And Hagen then... is naked in the morgue and he's got a boner. <laughs> of course he's got a boner. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> he's got a murder boner. He's got a literal murder boner. <laughs> uh, I think that the lead up to that too where like Hawkins just lying there and uh, like be trying, the police are trying to interrogate him and he's just like, I don't give a fuck, dude. Where it literally came down to, he, he was just like, I don't have a reason to live unless I can provide purpose or provide some kind of service to Eli. Mm-hmm. He was almost about to talk about the idea of, like, going to prison and rereading everything he read. And then as soon as Eli popped into his life, he's like, well, my priorities just shifted back to what they were before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, he's, oh my gosh. It's a very interesting, very disturbing, uh it's good yeah he is horrible he is horrible and now he's a now he's a literal monster we've got three vampires in this story now two of them are tragic one of them is horrifying yeah melty face vampire yeah and he has no face so now we have a no No face face vampire he's got one eye wait he didn't even have a mouth though he barely had one there were like flaps of skin over where and Mm -hmm. over like grafted skin pulling loose from where his mouth would be and his teeth were still able to elongate mm. so he's got some of the regenerative pseudo regenerative powers of a vampire now so oh, Ew, he's probably so squishy Ew. Oh, yeah no this is God. it was very disgusting it's I, very disgusting i'm now imagining this imagining him doing what a normal yeah. vampire does with his face and wow is it horrifying this is an image I didn't want to think of, and now I am. Duh, it's going to haunt Jesus nightmares. Um, hey, look, can we talk about the happy part? Oh, well, actually, I, I suppose we should throw some... There's one we briefly, 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 actually, weirdly enough, get a section from Johnny's perspective. <gasps> that was interesting. That I did not expect to be... F- oh, yeah, from... Oscar's bully. Okay, so to kind of clarify the the scene that happened with them earlier, so there, there's like a little class trip to the local lake. Yeah, so they can uh, go ice skating? Ice skating, or just to hang out in the snow, I guess, because Oscar didn't have skates, I think, he said, or his didn't fit. And so Johnny and the other two bullies were going to drop him in the ice. Yeah. Which could have potentially killed him. He could have, like, drowned. Yeah, honestly, I don't blame him for having struck out with the stick to defend himself. Mm -hmm. So he he found a rod and he, like, peeled it, like, peeled the extra twigs off. And so I I imagined it as more like a little, it was like a little whipping rod. Yeah. He kind of made out of this stick. And just whacks Johnny on the side of the head. And this, this scene was actually really interesting, too, because of... Oscar's reaction to it in that initially there was like this rush that he gets and he's like oh I have the power and he's like I could give him a few more wax and it'll be over he'll leave me alone yes then he like sees the guilt that uh or sees the pain that Johnny is in and then he's overwhelmed with the guilt enough that he like really cute he like pulls his his sock his shoe off and then takes his sock for him to like put against his ear it was super cute I was like oh <laughs> but for me that was kind of reassuring of Oscar's character because early on he's like stabbing a dead log pretending it's Johnny and you're like is this kid a psychopath is this you know one of the three signs of kids being psychopaths growing up into psychopaths <laughs> and I think if he was that far gone he wouldn't have felt that guilt yeah mm-hmm. no I mean the whole thing before was he was just kind of playing at the idea of being a murderer like it was yes. something to yeah. make him feel empowered before in a weird way, Elay came and made him feel empowered to the point where he actually started to take care of himself, you know? Mm-hmm. But when it came to the point where, oh, I could actually really hurt him, he doesn't. And I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean he still hurts him, but it's there. he's not a sociopath. No, he's not going to go and just continue to beat Johnny. No, he actually does 
have some feelings and Mm -hmm. does actually care. So that's a good thing because it separates the the way Oscar really is from the way that he might have we might have thought he could go. Oh, absolutely. Earlier in the story. So Mm -hmm. doesn't change the fact that Johnny is, you know, talking to Jimmy and we now get a little bit of insight because, yeah, like any good bully. Uh, Johnny's home life is kind of fucked. Well, it was what was interesting about that is that we learned. So Johnny's got an older brother who is into some shady things with his friends. Uh, but the thing, other thing we learned is that uh, Johnny's parents are divorced, mm-hmm. and he's at least met his father a few times. But his father's kind of a distant character, and we we've already learned earlier that Oscar is also he's definitely closer with his father, and that he actually visits his father occasionally. But it was kind of interesting. That, oh, you guys have things in common and things you could have related over, but instead you've got this victim and bully dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was interesting to me, and I felt a little bad for Johnny, but also, kid, you deserved it. He deserved it, but also the crazy thing is when they mentioned that they don't know for sure if his hearing is going to recover in that ear, apparently Mm -hmm. it was a lot more severe than even, I think, um, Oscar had anticipated, because I think he had originally just wanted to hit Johnny in the shoulder or something, that was the impression Mm -hmm. I got, and then he moved his head the wrong, he... Johnny flinched in a certain way where so instead the rod connected with his ear. Mm-hmm. Maybe it ruptured his eardrum or something. Uh, it's very likely. Oh, God. But then again, remember earlier part, um, Johnny, and he did this intentionally. He decided, he got so angry, he slashed um, Oscar's face. That wasn't Johnny, though. That was, that was, uh, to- was that Tomas? Tomas, I think. Oh, that, that was, was Tomas. Because it was Johnny, Meek, and uh, Tomas. Is it, and Tomas t- is the one that Johnny, that hit <laughs> Oscar in the face. That's right, because yeah. Tomas and him used to be friends. Yeah, yeah. And then Johnny is just a bully to him. Yeah, that mean that's important because the fact that we now have a chapter from his perspective means some significance is going to happen later on mm-hmm. with uh, with Johnny. No, uh, no Tommy. This this uh, arc, by the yeah. way. Yeah, we I get some references to Tommy, but no, like. Nothing from Tommy's perspective this time around. We put so much focus on him in part two. I'm shocked he never shows up in part three. He'll be back. I mean, they almost go to the place and they, I guess, they hear them sniffing paint or sni- or huffing Or they huffing smell paint. it. Eli mm-hmm. smells it at least. Yeah, for super, super sensitive smeller, sniffer yeah. power. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the Oscar the stuff with Oscar is like a nice little reprieve, even from the like super obvious supernatural and and body horror mm-hmm. and the violence. And instead, it's more of a domestic horror, low key misery of you know having what seems like a really cool dad until he starts drinking and becomes a, a sad soppy mess. Mm-hmm. Basically, what did he refer to him as? The werewolf. The werewolf. Yes. Like, it was just kind. Of, it was sad because. Uh, so my, my parents divorced when we were, when I was super young, my, my father literally left my mother in a foreign country where she did not speak the language with a two year old and like expecting another child. Um, but I have no memory of that. And the reason I feel for Oscar is that he's, he's this poor child of divorce, but he is old enough that his, he has to witness it. What I didn't like about oscar's father is that he wasn't strong enough to uh put a face forward to you know not traumatize his son in that okay i'm gonna get drunk and now i'm just gonna burden my own child with my problems when no you're the adult you need to get your shit together for Mm -hmm. your child Mm -hmm. you know yeah it's awful it's like foreshadowed so well because you because oscar's so conflicted about it because when he's not like that he seems like the very picture of what a good father should be you know and and, but his mom's like oh his his, he's such a child he was so immature you know that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and now we know why now we know why. That's right. That was very well foreshadowed. The, and the interesting part is, too, it does build into the whole, oh, it seems like he has a good relationship with his father. They're, they have in-jokes, and um, they play tic-tac-toe, and it's like, okay, I, I mean, I've not seen what the issue is. It isn't until Johnny comes over, and he's like, no, go away. Like, in his mind, he is thinking to this uh, neighbor or friend of his dad's, go away, I don't want you here. And then you realize he's, the reason why he doesn't like him is he gets his dad drinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And his dad drinks, he's not the person that Oscar wants to be around. Right, the he werewolf. Becomes, he becomes the man that his mother couldn't live with, mm-hmm. essentially. It, it's terrible because John Johnny, Oscar then decides to leave on his own. He hitchhikes to the bus station 
and goes back home. And he does that to teach his father a lesson. It's it's kind of... The child shouldn't be the one teaching the parent a lesson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you... Did you two find it interesting there was that bit where Oscar's almost like, well, I don't exist or something like that? He he brings that up. Like, it's like, there's just me. I don't exist for any of these particular forms because... And, and he's also kind of got his relationship with his mom's a little bit strained right now, too, after what happened with Johnny. You know? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting because, like, he kind of fixates on Elay, even though Elay's the monster... Or he sees Eli as a monster now. He's like, but then at least she didn't. I don't know. There was like, there was a silver lining there to the way that she's treated him before. And so he kind of gravitates back toward that. And that sort of elated feeling. I love that moment where he's got that elated feeling when he, he rings Eli's door in Morse code, starts to leave and then hears her voice. Like that joy that comes out of him when mm-hmm. she answers. Mm-hmm. And gosh darn it. I know there's so many twists. There's so much twistedness to this whole thing. But the two of them together is still. It's still pretty precious. Yeah. I know. It is really cute. I mean, I mean, they're even when they're talking and she admits that she's a vampire or not a vampire, but basically is a vampire. Basically a vampire. Uh, <laughs> not a vampire, but basically a vampire. But like it turns out she actually has all this money that she is stolen from people that she has killed basically well she says it was given to her mm-hmm. and and oscar assumes she's just stolen it from her victim but we do have i do um actually this got brought up earlier because we we asked you know just in general what are some of your f- most and least favorite things about yes. vampires and i wanted to bring that up i know we're kind of doing it out of sequence but um i i did get a couple yeah um, zaf said one word and that was charisma I want to touch on that real quick before we get back to that, because I feel like the scene in the hospital where she approaches um, the... Maud. I think her name was was Maud. Maud. So she comes up to Maud, and it seems like she's just able... Since we're getting it from Maud's perspective, we're getting the whole supernatural vampire charm thing, you know? And and Maud is the, the, I guess, like the front desk attendant at the hospital where Hawken was being held. Right. Just to, Uh, you know... Just to clarify, yeah. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, And she... And this has happened before, because she also pulled it on Hawken, when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. She's just... It's the, the ability to, for, you know essentially use your use some latent ability to make other people drop their guard make them more willing to do what you want them to do and she did also kind of do it with the the older woman when she went into her house oh yeah that's true she she okay she's yeah i'm i'm 12 and my mentality is at 12 forever but she still somehow knows enough to use that that childish demeanor to get things out of people whether that be a elderly old lady with her cat or a pedophile like right though the question is is she doing this to oscar too yeah if you think about it a lot of little kids know how to do this though like think Mm -hmm. about um younger siblings like uh they start to realize oh when i act cute or if i play into my youthfulness I will get out of trouble more likely. And my, I- my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, kids aren't stupid either. So No. I mean, Eli's 12 and is perpetually 12. So even with the, the fixed mentality and demeanor of a 12-year-old, she still knows how to exploit that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. She's not, she's not dumb. She's just 12. Mm-hmm. I'm 12 and what is this? <laughs> What is music? <laughs> <laughs> I like with the moment when uh, when Oscar tries to play Kiss for her, and she's like, ah! Because her ears are probably super sensitive. You know? Oh, yeah. That's right. She feels things and hears things and smells things. Uh, I mean, I don't want to disappear from anything too long, but can, can we acknowledge that she basically kissed Oscar and gave him a flashback? That was interesting. <laughs> yeah, and it also does confirm that the, the story that we that she was telling that elderly woman was, was Eli's story. Of, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or is it Elias' this, story? Sorry, Elias' story of like... <laughs> essentially the start of how they ended up becoming a vampire but we don't know the full story yet right cut away on i think uh some white dice yeah that's i mean i made that that's why i made that references or they roll 2d6 to see how many vampires oh okay i was like what what is david getting (laughs) at (laughs) um they we get another we get another perspective of the i presume the elder vampire the vampire that made elay into one yeah and 
I like how this person is described as like thin and and scary looking with like two red lips and wearing some sort of wig. I almost want to picture it's a Nosferatu in a bad disguise. Like think Count Orlock, but wearing a wig and, and lipstick. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> Will we get more flashbacks? I probably well they'd have to kiss more for that. Or maybe we'll get more stories. Who knows? I am eager to because uh, for this next for the next episode we're reading both parts four and five and we'll get to finish up the, the <sighs> book. Yep. Um, I I should let you know uh, there is one more uh, comment on uh, what they someone thought was the scariest and worst aspect of a vampire, mm-hmm. and this was said by Knit Cap Dan. We probably I probably should have mentioned it earlier because it fit more with what we were talking about. But he says, it's really been softened lately in media with something as simple as two fang marks. But there's something very frightening and violently primal and animalistic about vampires targeting the neck for their bites. Mm. Anything that goes for the neck in the animal world is going for a quick instant kill. Yeah. Oh, true. Yeah, no kidding. You know, it's funny because like in a lot of the older vampire lore, when vampires turn into to animals, it's not just bats. They can also turn into wolves. Mm-hmm. And you think about a wolf lunging at someone's neck. You know, that's a very predatory thing. Vampires are predators. So and, and, and when when Ile uh, attacks people, it's not just a gentle like bite the neck. It's not. No. And she's literally like trying to rip their throats open so she can get to the blood. Yeah. Yeah. She becomes extremely animalistic. I mean, if you recall, even when she was biting uh, Jacques, she was clamping on like she would not let go. And she had like fierce strength mm-hmm. just like sucking him dry. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. Well, we know we know Ile. When Ile goes in to to feed, they she means to kill. Yeah. Uh, versus like some maybe a more alluring vampire like Dracula, where it's kind of it's meant to be more. Well, it's a portrait to be more sensual, so it's not as not as violent, but still a little scary. And I mean, your jugular is there, and I guess that's why they go for the neck. But um, yeah, I tend to I tend to enjoy vampires when they're more uh, bestial and more like savage like mm-hmm. i think that's a scarier thing is the idea of this of not just coming in for the slow almost seductive thing but instead yeah. just like the fangs come out your throat's torn open and i'm lapping up the lifeblood that's flowing out of yes. you that's horrifying i i like i like both both the uh, us uh, ends of this spectrum i guess i i love <laughs> i enjoy a variety of vampires um, you know um when when Zaf made the reference to the charisma thing, mm-hmm. he noted, uh, fa- you know, there's lots of vampires that do do that. And Ile definitely does that. And the example he cited was uh, Dio Brando from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Jeez. which I appreciated. But then again, Dio, Dio, but that's one of the is one of the scary things about him, too, is like he's able to just like control people just through sheer force of will. He builds up a whole entourage of powerful uh, minions because they're like, we're so afraid of him. The fear turned around and became fascination. Like, I've never felt fear that exquisite before. That's, like, the whole idea. Not that I find... Not that I, you know, looking at him with his crazy, you know, Iraqi pose that he does. <laughs> but, like, I get it. I get it. Um, another thing I found interesting, by the way, about Ile and Oscar's interaction. Uh, two things. One, there's a weird moment with, like, hey, check out this egg. It turns out it's a... A puzzle. Puzzle. A really, really complicated what? puzzle. Which I'm kind of confused by. Why is this being addressed? Why? Be- uh, because I, I think the impression I was getting was that all the quote-unquote toys that Oscar finds, because there was one other thing as well, they're all puzzles. They're all brain teasers. Ile has to find stuff to keep herself occupied because she's shut inside most of the time. And it's also been alive for centuries. Mm-hmm. So she's going to need something to keep her occupied. So these really super complicated puzzles. So it's not she's so good at the Rubik's Cube. Because she's basically using... She's distracting herself. Mm-hmm. And, and usual, typically in vampire lore, we they sleep during the day, but Oscar, it was implying that Ile doesn't sleep. That's right, because uh, um, there's a point where Oscar yawns and then Ile yawns, and he's like, you're, you're not really tired, are you? And she's like, no, I'm not. But it's nighttime, so... I mean, um... Virginia, I mean, if we're going to check fact check that, let's cycle back to Virginia, who slept, who has been sleeping weirdly, you mm-hmm. know? Yes, but Virginia is in the middle of transitioning, oh, and yeah. your body heals and fixes and changes the most while it's sleeping. Mmm, fair enough. Um, another thing, too, is um, between Oscar and Ely's interaction is that 
they wrestle each other. But in the past when she's like wrestled someone or she's it's always been an attack. Mm-hmm. Where in this case it feels more childish. I mean, more yes, like he's... children playing, yeah, exactly. But then again, he, this was instigated by Oscar taking one of her toys and essentially smacking her in the head with it really hard because he yeah. got so mad. Yeah, it was a little scary because I thought, oh, I hope Eli, Eli might accidentally hurt him in that not knowing her own strength. Like she maybe has never used her strength playing with another child, with an actual child. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it no, that I either. Ile is very was very careful and knew what she was doing and was letting Oscar work his frustrations out on her, or I don't know. It was a very it was a very curious scene where I wasn't entirely sure how to read it. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah, it does, I don't know either. Yeah, even Oscar at the end was like, I don't I don't know if I believe you. You're giving me money, hoping I'll stay, and I don't want that. Are you using me? You know. He. Oh, I think this to me the interesting thing that was scary was that once again Oscar in a in a moment of anger lashes out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know I don't know how much of it was self defense and how like with, with what happened with um, Johnny, but that puts that into perspective. Maybe you know he was immediately felt guilty, but there is that long buried sort of like I. I'm sick and tired of people not letting me do what I want to do, you know? It happened with the bullies a lot. And, and this all happened because she wouldn't let him go. He said, let me go, let go. And then she wouldn't, so he turned around and smacked her with the puzzle, the teaser, the, the thing. Mm-hmm. And then that turned into the wrestling bit. Mm-hmm. I think I think Oscar has a side of him that is, that is angry. He does have some frustration. And he's kind of starting to realize that. We've seen him acting out a couple times now. Mm-hmm. Um, what that's going to lead to, I, I honestly don't know. But, like, I don't know what to anticipate, and I like that. <laughs> Me too. Actually, the big... And, and then the big thing, the big thing I want to address is the reveal of Elias. Mm-hmm. Yes. We still don't know what this, this exactly means, per se. Because there's going to be more nuance to this than we know, but Ile, what is or was Elias mm-hmm. once? Yes. So... What does that mean? What do you think that means? Well, I know, but I'm not. I already it. know because of the movie. Oh, you you people are terrible. I know. Sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm just gonna let that. We're gonna let that hang because I imagine that's gonna be a big talking point when we finish. Oh, this. absolutely. A huge uh-huh. talking point because it's been building pretty pretty naturally. Even when Oscar has the conversation with um, his teacher mm-hmm. about like you know what does it feel like when you're in love brings it up like you know it's usually a thing but then he's like what if it's a what can two can two boys be like that and i'm like okay so this is interesting and the the teacher was like well there can be friends and that's the kind of love and then she's like well i guess also they can be like that (laughs) we should talk about that later (laughs) i i I forgot about that conversation because so there was that point when i was reading it's like well it's more like friends i'm like "Uh uh uh sure and then she's like well they could be in love i'm like good Good. I was reading this and my, my mind immediately two words popped into my head and that was Fujoshi trash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, forever and always. <laughs> <laughs> I know you too well at this point, so it's all good. Don't worry. No 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 shaming. Oh here. no, anytime, no shame here. Anytime we watch something or see something I'm and we're all like, hmm, what would say <laughs> say <laughs> Who would say WW say WWSS, but would say ship. Oh my god. <laughs> Who would say ship? I, would say I am ship? very capable of shipping a lot of things. That's yes. true. So, uh, any predictions for for the final two parts? Or Hawkins going to come and try and kill Oscar. That's what I think is going to happen. Who knows? We'll yeah, see. Yeah, we already got the feeling that he kind of hates Oscar for just because of the attention that Ely was giving him. Oh. Yeah, for sure. And that was one of the last things that he was dwelling on before even the he Eli came to him. Uh-huh. And now he's a insane vampire. So, um yeah. Oh, I think I'm really curious about is what's going to happen to Virginia. I yeah. Cuz I feel like with with Hawken and Eli and Oscar, I I feel like okay, I I have an idea of like where they might end up. 
I'm not too sure about Virginia, of whether she's going to survive the end of this book or not. I have a question for you, actually, because you've seen the the movie, right? Yes, Mm -hmm. but a very long time ago, enough that, and there's stuff that happened in this part of the book that wasn't in the movie, and I was was pleasantly surprised. I was like, I was about to ask if Virginia is in the movie. I do not remember Virginia in the movie. I actually don't remember much of the Chinese restaurant group. I don't think they were in the movie at all. They maybe didn't factor in as much. I think one of the things you and I should do, David, and if say if you'd like to as well, of course, I think before the next, uh, we record the next episode, let's read let's read the rest of the book and then we should watch the movie. I'm yes. I'm down. I say I'm we, we watch the movie together and we can put that out as a bonus episode for Patreons. But Ooh. by Patreons, I mean Creative Heart Patreons. Which there now we go. I think it's just been that many there are Patreons. I mean, they... <laughs> They exist. All of them yes. exist. Mm-hmm. Um, things are things are things are shifting in interesting ways over at Creative Horror. That's all yes, I'm gonna say. Yes. So I think we could either record it as like a kind of bonus episode where we like just snip out the inter- interesting audio parts, or I don't know if we could do it as like a screening for our Patreon Discord. Oh, because, uh, I I would like Life that idea, but the movie is a little on the I mean it's not like we're not getting like full pedophile moments with Hawken. I don't remember. I don't remember. Thank I, I, I know there was But like I, I do think we would have to be like, hey guys, this is a horror movie and it's got some themes. So and I Disclaimer, don't Disclaimer, y'all. Yeah, I don't know the complete age range of all of our patrons. Mm. I mean I think most of them, if not all of them, are over the age of eighteen. From what I I don't yeah. ooh, I, most I mean of them. Most of them, yeah. That's going to be a tricky thing. We'll, Guys, we'll see what happens. They have to get get us a parent permission slip. <laughs> we <laughs> have a parent permission slip. Fair enough. Oh, man. I'm going to be so sad when this is over, but I think we already have an inkling what we might do next. I'm not going to say it yet, but at the end of the next episode, we'll talk about what we're going to be covering yes. next. Oh, no, we already... Oh, I mean, we did kind of already say it when I threw out the idea as a joke. And and I've actually been already getting uh, votes in already, or, like, comments in. Uh, we're going to be reading a Goosebumps book. <laughs> <laughs> nice change of pace, huh? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, if you guys want to, any of you uh, listening, want to recommend a Goosebumps book for us to read, please. Uh, uh, I think I announced this on Twitter already though uh that when this gets out or this uh episode gets out then i will uh send out a poll for everyone to uh decide which goosebumps book we should read right there's a lot of them though so yes because we do want to decide we do want to decide in one by next episode so we can announce next episode what which one it is okay that sounds Um, good so try to oh i guess so you're gonna put the poll out when this episode goes out I was thinking of doing that, um, but maybe it would be better to do it a couple weeks beforehand. Maybe we do it. Maybe we do handle it like this. We get recommendations, whatever we, and then we put a poll together from sort of like the ones that people, the ones that people are pitching the most, or maybe a few of the ones that we're most interested in. My pitch was for Welcome to Dead House because it's Goosebumps number one. Mm -hmm. Um, Um, Someone else actually pitched that as well already, mm -hmm. but. Uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I'll I'll extend the deadline. Uh, feel free to uh, message us on Twitter at Darkly Lit Pod, um, letting us know which Goosebumps book you would like us uh, to read. You can check out the other podcasts on the Creative Horror Network while you're mm-hmm. at it, including Trick or Track, The Witching Hour, Midnight Marinara, Undercooked Analysis, and uh, you know, nice plethora of shows there, and eventually more. Mm-hmm. So, which I look forward to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Soon. Um, Sometime soon. soon. <laughs> um, Big plans for this year. It's a new decade. We got to get things. We got to get. We got to get uh, things rolling. We got to really get things rolling. Yeah. We're rolling. We're we're literally rolling. rolling. We're rolling. <laughs> we're doing this whole, Did not mean to do that. This whole podcast we've been doing while sitting in a spinning barrel. So just fun fact. <laughs> uh, well, until next week, convene. Um, I uh, will blow out the candle, but. Uh, Make sure we walk together, cause, uh... I'm staying away from that underpass. That thing gives me the creeps. Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinera, and this podcast is part of creativehorror.com. 
a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at creativehorror.com. Ha, 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 ha.